to CO2 here in Geneva, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the XDX Dataset Deep Dive, this time featuring ACLET, which is short for the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project. My name is Javier Teran. I work for the Center for Humanitarian Data, and we have prepared a very interesting, interesting session for you, where you will learn a lot more about ACLET data, the analysis, and the tools. Uh, this session will be recorded and, and will be available soon after the end of the webinar in the Center's YouTube channel. The chat box is also open for you to comment or to ask any questions as the webinar progresses. Um, uh, the agenda for today, uh, Godfrey, if you can share the next slide, will be the following. So we'll have some opening remarks from Professor Kleina Ralik. Then we're gonna have an overview of the Center for Humanitarian Data, but also of XDX, which is short for the Humanitarian Data Exchange, where you can find a lot of humanitarian data. We're gonna go soon after that immediately for a deep dive on ACLET's data analysis and tools. And at the end, I hope we can uh, uh, count with you to have an interactive sessions on comments, questions, and answers. Next slide, Godfrey, please. Uh, today we have a, an amazing lineup of presenters. So we have Professor Klina Raleigh, who is the president and CEO of ACLET. And together with her, we have Leonard Landman, head of methodology at ACLET, Andrea Carboni, head of analysis, Dr. Katayun Kishi, head of data science, and Metasevia Salu, who is the data manager at the Center for Humanitarian Data. Uh, with this, I think I give you, I give the floor to you, uh, Professor Klina, over to you for your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak, not just with, of course, in a collaboration with HDX, but to everybody who is attending. Um, we are, uh, we are ACLED, and as, as mentioned by Javier, we're the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project. We have been working on shared initiatives with HDX now for a while, and we're taking this opportunity to make sure that everybody is aware both how to access ACLED data, but also what you can do with it and what we happen to be using our data for, um, and hope that it is of interest to the attendees. Um, I do want to mention that we are in a, a moment where there has been a big, big focus on available data and open data. And we would like to um, express, of course, our thanks to HDX for initiating this discussion. And of course, the HDX um, agenda is to provide these data to people and ACLED's agenda is to create these data and to, to make them available. So I hope today is um, informative. Uh, we are always available, of course, to answer questions that people may have. But um, our, our purpose here is to make sure everybody knows how to access and use ACLED data. And I also wanted to note that the provision of these data, the availability of this work is of course um, largely due to CRAFT, which is an initiative in the UN and with uh, partner governments to provide support for data initiatives to be able to um, live up to the expectations of people within the humanitarian and practitioner communities and the data needs they have. And we're very grateful for craft support. And we would like to, of course, um, for this to be one of our first um, attempts and, and webinars in which we discuss the ongoing work at ACLED and, of course, invite everybody to use to use it. Um, and with that, I will I will turn over to to Meta, so she, she can um, discuss it. Right, Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Gliona, for your remarks. Um, I will now move on to the next agenda item, which is to give you an overview on the center, the HDX platform, and the ACLED data sets hosted on it. Um, UN OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data was established with a goal to increase the use and impact of humanitarian uh, data in humanitarian response. And to do that, the center structured its work into these four um, uh, focus areas. Um, I think this slide, yeah. So, uh, data services, increasing the interoperability of data through shared standards and integrated systems. Data science, increasing OCHA's ability to anticipate crisis before they happen. 
data responsibility, increasing trust and cooperation across organizations sharing data and humanitarian response, learning and practice, increasing the capability of people to access and use data in support of humanitarian efforts. The Humanitarian Data Exchange Platform, or HDX in short, was established in 2014, and since then we have seen growth in many dimensions. In 2022, HDX was used by 1.5 million people in 233 countries and territories, an increase of 8% compared with 2021. Around 1.8 million datasets were downloaded throughout the year. And currently, there are close to 300 active organizations that are sharing data on the platform. ACLET um, has been sharing data sets on HDX since 2015, and we very much value our partnership. And here, what you see on the screen is a screenshot of ACLET's page on HDX, where you can find the 246 data sets covering some 200 countries and territories. ACLET provides high value data sets for an important category on the HDX data grids. Data grid is a feature on HDX to present the most relevant data sets for a country with a humanitarian response plan. And as you can see in this uh, screenshot for the 23 HRP locations, ACLET data has filled uh, the conflict events category. If you'd like to know more about data grids and the different categories, um, please go to the link that will uh, momentarily be shared in the chat. Um, so with that, I will now pass it back to Professor Cleona for the deep dive into Aklet's work. Over to you. Brilliant, thanks very much. Next slide, please. Um, thank you. So I will first go through, of course, what ACLED is and what it does, and then talk a little bit more about access and then about how we observe and, and uh, analyze conflict. Next slide, please. So what does ACLED do? So it is, as I mentioned, the Armed Conflict Location Event Data Project. It's a public, a global, real-time collection of political violence, disorder events, and demonstration data all from locally based researchers and of course our local partners. So we collect information in 100 local languages and from over 5,000 sources uh, every week. So we release the information on Mondays and Tuesdays for our weekly release. We have over 1.5 million events to date from every country in the world. We recently, um, well, recently it was last year, we achieved global coverage. We have 65 local partners and we're always eager to add more. Um, we effectively are trying to provide all of the reported information about every act of disorder and demonstration in the world. And we want to make that both public and open access. So along with these data, we have been very clear about our methodology. And in fact, many people on the call today from ACLED can speak to these very detailed methodologies, analysis, data science, and collections. And so we have a constant stream of analysis to complement our work and our data. And all of this is available both on our website, but also through HDX, if that is preferred. Next slide, please. So um, to register and access ACLA data, there's a very, very simple three-step process. Civil society users have unlimited access to ACLA data by registering for a free account once, and of course, agreeing to the terms of use and attribution policy. Civil society users include humanitarian organizations, human rights groups, academia, the media, amongst others. And what you do is you register, you get a registration um, ID, and then you use that in the access portal where you can download the data immediately as you wish and as many times as you wish, and then also have access to some of our excellent new products such as the early warning system and, of course, the, um, the predictive analytics that, that has been done by data science. So government and commercial or for-profit users are granted free but not unlimited access upon registration. But today we really are going to focus on the civil society users or the public users as we would refer to them. And the very, very simple process of both registering, which allows you access to ACLED. Next, please. 
So once you have the data, the raw data, if that's what you're interested in, we have, of course, a quick guide to how to understand it. And of course, the export tool that allows you to download whatever you wish or our curated data, which is often by region or by theme. You can, of course, also make use of the dashboard for um, to visualize these data before you download them. And as I mentioned, there is a registration process that you can access through here. And if you would like to review our terms of use, that's also available here. We have a very, very extensive um, resource library that allows people to be able to see exactly what's available, explain different facets of the data and the methodology. Next, please. So as I mentioned, if you would like to, there's um, quick guides to ACLED data, um, which include things, as I mentioned, like methodology or data science or um, particular countries and definitions that we have had. Um, and these tend to be very, very useful for people when they are first learning and would like to know what each of the columns means and the code book, et cetera. So those are pretty straightforward to get. Thank you. Next, please. So there's a lot of advantages to event data over what came before. Um, so what was what was typically available before was national annual level data. And so what we have available to us now is granular, rich, and as I mentioned, timely information. There's a lot of advantages as I've lifted as I've noted here, for the granularity, as I mentioned, ACLED uh, creates information on the day action level. So uh, we have information about a range of event types that happen within all countries, from protests to more um, to more armed organized activity. Um, it's quite rich because we cover all violent actors and, of course, um, social movements and states, we can capture quite a, a wide range of subnational patterns. It's very compatible, which often requires um, very good skills in order to be able to link event data with other types of data. But on HDX, I think um, that's quite straightforward. It's accountable, meaning that we are able to link these um, these events with the sources and, of course, the information where we got it. And so um, so we're, we're trying to be as transparent as possible. As I mentioned, it's timely. It's close to real time, which is um, a huge amount of effort, but we believe that it's very important in order for people to be able to be responsive and to know what's happening. And as mentioned, the timeliness allows it to be actionable. So we produce information on Monday that went up to Friday night. Um, and in this way, what we're trying to do is create some sort of early warning or very, very precise descriptions about what's happening across the world. Next, please. So there's also challenges to event data that um, I think is, are important to, to recognize. So there is, of course, bias concerns. Um, and we recently, in fact, completed a, 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 an article about the types of biases that are present, which I'm happy to, to link to in the chat. Um, some of it can be scalable, but of course, it's a tremendous amount of information to deal with. And so people have to be careful, which which goes along with one of our data literacy objectives. People have to be careful about what it is they aggregate and how they do so. And of course, there's trade offs between coverage and depth, which um, which we're happy to talk about in the in the um, in the chat. But I do want to be really clear to people that we think a lot about the best ways to capture information to make it available and to make sure it's as accurate and robust as possible. So when it comes to the bias, scalability and consistency of event information, we think about it constantly and, and make sure that we have best practices um, and, and put those or, or rather um, action those in, in the data collection. And to do so, we've really spent a lot of time trying to make sure that event data is consistent. And what that means is that we have transparent, clear and replicable coding rules. Um, and Leonard, of course, um, who is head of methodology, can speak a lot to the ways in which we have an ever expanding quality control for each event. So um, so that every piece of data you can have some trust in and 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 believe that it is as it is exactly as it is reported um, and improved to be part of a consistent data set. Next, please. 
As you all may know, of course, there's different types of, of information available for conflict. There's researcher-led coding and there's automated coding. That's how they mainly break down. And again, we have another article that has recently been completed that talks a lot about the differences in how researcher-led coding and automated coding produce information. But researcher-led is effectively human researchers and or coders who review reports and then they use a categorization and a schema to code that information. In automated coding, which has received an awful lot of attention recently, of course, because of the rise of AI and the ways in which uh, people would like to integrate more AI into work, automated coding is effectively a trawling of sources, often, often clearly defined, and then putting those into a automatic coding schema. So what this tends to risk is event inflation through duplication, misinformation and disinformation. There's no checking of the records, and so you get both an over and an under reporting. What automated coding does, in my opinion, is that it often is a recording of the attention a conflict gets rather than the characteristics of that conflict, which is something that researcher-led coding can really focus on because of the inclusion and exclusion criteria that go into the methodology. So there are, of course, benefits to, to both, but I would say that by and large, the benefits are very much accrued on the researcher-led coding side with um, certain types of automation to kind of augment or to make processes more efficient. But um, you really want to be clear about the information that's being collected and presented to you as users of data about how that's been collected and, and, um, and what, kind of in, what kind of agenda was behind it. And if the agenda is to make sure that you have the most robust and thorough information about political violence, then that's going to require a very deep sourcing network and, of course, a way in which you can code and categorize information that is representative of what's happening on the ground rather than a model. Next, please. Thank you. So when you're comparing any event data, which uh, increasingly is available rather than the country level data that I spoke about before, um, what we think about and what we think that you may also be thinking about when you're using it is whether or not the data are meaningful. As I just mentioned, you have to consider the assumptions that went into the collection um, and what kind of what kind of conflict is it trying to define, to measure and code. So is it seeking to capture what you want it to capture? And if the answer is no, then it may not be as useful to you as you think. Um, and it may be, of course, that those who are trying to uh, use event data need it for a particular context, but not others, in which case there are, there are often choices. But um, for a global data set to be consistent and robust, um, it really does require these assumptions to be laid out very, very clearly. The second thing that we think about a lot is how reliable it is. So has the data, have the data creators really grappled with the potential biases that are present and may produce significant changes to analysis? And of course, a robust and transparent methodology will tell you how reliable things are. Is it ethical? Have data collection and coding procedures been, been uh, designed to make sure that Precautions have been taken, security and the dignity of conflict affected populations is, is top of mind. Um, that will also be um, pretty clear in a project that, um, that focuses on local partners. And so I would recommend that if this is a concern, as it should be to everybody, that um, they're made aware of that. Is it scalable? So if I were to download data today on Sudan, in ACLED, I know it's collected and it's coded in the same way as data for Afghanistan or data for Mexico, which allows me to answer a, a series of questions that would have been impossible if all three countries had a very different schema involved. And it would not allow for cross-sectional analysis if it was not scalable. And is it usable? Um, this is something, of course, that HDX has, has really done so well. Um, making data both easily understood, accessed, downloaded, stored, and analyzed. It's something, again, that we think about a lot. And of course, is it actionable? So actionable is really, um, it's in the eye of the beholder. 
but uh, the way that we produce information and the timeliness that we produce it make it seem that we are in fact very, very focused on making sure that the data are as actionable as possible. Next, please. I'm going to give you an example of how this looks in in practice. So here we have two event data sets, both both researcher led collections, and you can see that on the left, we have the Philippines as according to ACLED and on the right, we have the Philippines according to another event data set, UCDP GED. And these two data sets purport to record very similar types of conflict, but as you can see, uh, using the schema of UCDP, which is non-state conflicts, state-based conflicts, and one-sided violence, what you get in response to this is a vastly different picture of Filipino violence. Um, and the reasons for that are pretty straightforward. One is, are you coding events that happen across the spectrum of, the, of violence? Or are you coding a, a more narrow strata of events? The second reason is, are you coding in the language or languages spoken in country or throughout the country. If you are not, and you're capturing English language sourcing, you are going to only get those events that might be interesting or reported to English language newspapers, often international newspapers. And these, the attention that you can get from English level or English language newspapers is quite different than the types of risks and threats that tend to be most interesting and useful and important to uh, local residents and, of course, to the national security. And so this is one way in which it may look as if a coding and a conflict classification is very similar in similar sounding data sets, but the results are vastly different depending on important things like the agenda of the data set, the sourcing of those data sets, and of course, um, any biases that these data have. Many times, biases are not mistakes, but they're intentional, as in our bias, if you will, is to make sure that we capture the spectrum of, of political violence, which means that we are going to spend as much time searching for um, details of a protest than any other type of event. That's not the same type of intentionality of other data sets, and it's important to, to recognize those things. Next, please. Here's another example. Of course, this is violence in Brazil. It's the exact same um, setup as the one before. But what you can see here is that while ACLED collects information on Brazil, and in fact ranks Brazil as one of our most violent countries in the world because of the variety of violence, especially those that are affecting civilians that occurs within the state, but also, of course, for the number of, of armed organized actors that are active in Brazil. The threshold at what at which we we collect information is if it is not fatality based. So we do not wait for a fatality of an armed organized group to occur in order to include it within our data set. What we're looking for is an act, an event of political violence or a demonstration. And as you can see here, just comparing the types of data that we would both collect. So as you can see here, it does not include demonstrations, which we do include typically, but just comparing the types of information that both data sets presented here do collect, we still get a vastly different picture of what Brazil's political violence looks like if you use one data set versus another. And this has, of course, huge ramifications for how actionable the, the information is for practitioners and, of course, for political analysts more generally. Next, please. Thank you. So one of the main things that can account for these differences is, as I mentioned before, how we integrate local language sourcing. Um, ACLED has made a huge effort to make sure that what we collect is often first in at least one of the languages spoken nationally or subnationally rather than English. And as you can see here, this is a map of where we prioritize English sources or where rather we have many English sources and where we have local non-English sources. And as you can imagine, countries that have speak English, we often will have many English sources. Countries that both speak a, a range of languages or where English is not the primary language, we will make sure that the sourcing is done within those languages, which, um, which means that we effectively have quite a range of, um, of, of sources, over 5,000, as I mentioned earlier, and our researchers 
have a range of skills and of course are located throughout the world and supplemented and complemented by our local partners. Next, please. So what does this mean in terms of a conflict? So here, for example, is, um, is Syria. Uh, it's 2018 in Syria. And on the left, we have what traditional media, so not necessarily just English sources um, or English language sources, but for the most part, what English media reported in 2018 versus what local partners and media, both subnational, local and national and regional, reported for that conflict. And as you can see, again, even in a conflict that was widely reported, where reporters were embedded, where there was a lot of attention, what you can imagine as the actual conflict environment is drastically different depending on whether or not you focus on traditional media or full source coverage. These differences have enormous impacts, both on how we believe the trajectory of the conflict is going, who is at risk, and of course, how actionable or what kind of response is necessary. Next, please. So I wanted to just quickly review how we approach conflict. So what we think about what we're trying to do here. And really over the last few years, we have uh, developed a set of guidelines, if you will, that we try to reiterate to people so that they know how modern conflict looks in practice. And it looks quite different than I think many people think. The first is that conflicts differ, even those occurring within the same country. So two, multiple conflicts can co-occur within a country and have nothing to do with each other. Some places have conflict, some places don't. But that doesn't mean that the places that have conflict have the same conflict with the same actors and with the same targets. Often we have very, very different types of violence occurring within the same country. And so we can't explain them using the same criteria, we can't explain them using the same reasoning. Number three, armed groups have different signatures, they have different structures, they have different agendas, means, and capabilities, which means that a rebel group has a very different agenda than a militia. A local or a communal armed group has a very different agenda even than a state, a state security forces. And we must be able to understand how these groups are not just potentially cooperating together, but how they are operating within the same environment. Number four, who is affected by which type of conflict is different? As I mentioned before, rebels have particular types of targets or the particular types of primary targets that often tend to be governments. But militias often are engaged to fight other militias or civilians. So they, for example, they tend to be hired and used by different political elites within a system or even different conflict actors. And so their agenda is going to have a certain spatial signature and a certain violent signature that we should be able to discern and see in the data. And in turn, that has a lot of differences on the costs of conflict, how many people are exposed to it and where they're exposed. Next, please. One of the things that we say a lot at ACLED is that conflicts emerge from political competition, right? That's the cause of violence, political competition. That competition can be highly localized, it can be national, it can be international, but that's what conflict is coming from. So what are people competing for and at what scale is the first question that not only we ask, but we encourage others to ask about any conflict. Because once you have those relationships clear, I think a lot more about who is violent and how they're violent tends to become clear. Number six, all armed groups use similar events, right? So using violence events by groups requires you to ask where, how, what kind of intensity are they employing? Because most armed groups will involve themselves in some sort of battles or violence against civilians. And if they have the technology, of course, um, bombings and those types of more technologically sophisticated warfare, but the events themselves will tell us something, especially about the, the populations that are affected, but they won't tell us typically about the groups themselves. For that, you have to use um, important aspects like where they're active. And as, as I mentioned before, ACLED has given this a lot of thought. And what we do is we include in our data set um, elements like interactions and what what the intentionality of that actor is through those interactions that we hope that you will find similarly useful. So distinctions between event type versus the forms and drivers of conflict is a really important aspect here. So we do not in ACLED 
designate a climate conflict, not just because I don't think they occur, but also election violence or resource conflict. What we're saying is that the actual events themselves don't appear to be having a pattern except for they might be higher or lower during particular periods of competition. But the actors and the events and the drivers of violence can shift very drastically throughout a conflict. And so we need to be as agile in our thoughts as these groups are in their actions and not get driven by a particular explanation and expect the events to kind of fit in that explanation. I really encourage people when they do conflict analysis to be a bit more open-minded about what they expect to find rather than predetermining their outcome. And the last is that conflicts, of course, differ with respect to which sequence of activity they exhibit. So what armed actors engage with each other and how many, whether civilians are the main targets, how diffuse and how deadly it is, because what you can see is that across a conflict, a group has to be flexible to the conflict environment. And again, if we are open minded about what that conflict environment may look like, what kind of competitions are driving it, we can often answer a lot of the questions about what we expect next based on what we've seen by allowing these groups to have or allowing ourselves to see the agenda of groups and the opportunities that they have in front of them to make more violence. We don't treat violence as a breakdown in our analysis at ACLED, but rather as a tool of a system in which violence is there for the distribution of power. And of course, as I mentioned before, kind of motivated by political competition. And with that in mind, I'd like to just review quite quickly some of the work that we are doing here. Next, please. Here, of course, we have our analysis. This is a good example of how we try to break down and apply these features. We've got mob analysis and, of course, pressure points. Andrea will speak a little bit more about this analysis as we go forward. Next, please. We have recently developed a conflict severity index whereas where we say all conflicts, sorry, all countries in the world typically host some form or some level of political violence. And once we understand that, then we can ask, well, what, how is this violence differentiated? And one of the ways we would like to do so is by asking how severe it is, whether or not the danger, the diffusion, the fragmentation of this violence is so severe that it ranks as one of the most violent places in the world and one of the most difficult places in the world to mitigate that violence. And so from the 2002 data, we identified seven countries that we believe are incredibly violent and where the violence is very flexible and quite difficult to manage and mitigate because it, it exhibits very high rates of, of severity based on our four factors. And these countries included Colombia, Haiti, Mali, Mexico, Myanmar, Syria, and Yemen. And what's interesting about those cases is that one, of course, they're not traditional wars for the most part. Um, they, they have a very high event total, but it's not the most violent place in the world. That's Ukraine. Um, but they exhibit a type of violence that is, as I mentioned, both deadly and diffuse and fragmented that has a really important attribute. These are really important attributes to understand why Colombia still remains violent even after the peace agreement, why Myanmar has over 100 different armed active groups, why Mexico's violence is very difficult for people to describe because they're trying to look at it either through a criminal lens or through a political lens, when in fact those two things are, are, um, are mixed. Next, please. Here are some other um, elements of that index and, and of course the conflict watch list in 2023 that we, where we focus on particular countries that we think are of great importance to the world. Next, please. And again, here's more of our analysis. Um, we're, we allow all of the analysis, of course, to be open and public, and we really wish to make sure that, that people know that what we're trying to do here is to identify the patterns that we see in the data that we believe are very helpful for people to know about so they can get a more precise and a more accurate picture of what's happening within global patterns of violence worldwide, not just in wars that we know about, but rather across the world. Next, please. Here we have some very specific information that we're producing. We have the Yemen Truce Monitor, um, and that will be further developed later this year. 
We have election violence monitors. This was for Nigeria um, earlier this year. Um, we spend an awful lot of time trying to figure out which countries have such complex and, and severe violence that it, it would be useful for the larger conflict community to know more. That's why we produce these particular types of, of uh, analyses. And in the next slide, you will see our two conflict observatories in uh, Mozambique and Ethiopia, where we have a dedicated uh, weekly review of the violence happening in both contexts. And of course, as I mentioned, Yemen will be added to that later this year. Uh, here we produce the information both in the local languages and of course in English to make sure that it also has a big effect and a useful effect in country, which is very important for us. Next, please. Here we have the Early Warning Research Hub, where we do an awful lot of this analysis, as I previously mentioned. And Kadi Yunkishi, who's also on the call, will be able to speak a little bit more about these really fascinating um, tools that she and her team have developed to make sure that rather than just the raw data, it is related, it's relatable to you in ways that I think are immediately useful, including, of course, the change map, subnational surges, the emerging actor tool, and volatility and risk predictability. And next, please. This is the ACLED conflict alert system, which again, um, Dr. Kishi also developed with her team. And this is a step beyond what I've just shown you in terms of early warning, where we are looking for how predictable or how, um, what kind of patterns are we seeing emerge immediately and into the near future across the world. And I'm sure that she will be able to give a, a brief on that. So uh, my last two slides were about the an upcoming project that we're working on with WorldPOP, where we're trying to add a new conflict indicator into ACLED, which will be the population exposed to violence. Um, at a, I believe we've de we've decided at a two kilometer um, radius around an affected conflict location. And next slide, please. Actually, the next one, please is this is the event rate of population, and this is the population exposure rate. And what we can see is that very different rates of exposure are present throughout the world. In the United States, for example, 5.4% of the population is exposed to some level of, of political violence, or at least one event of political violence last year. Whereas, of course, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, it's 25%. In Syria, it's 85%. And what we hope to do with this information is to provide you with a new tool, not just events, not just fatalities, but also the exposed population. And so we can gauge what kind of responsive, um, what kind of best response and best actions can be used, but also what kind of elements affect how many people are exposed to violence. Next, please. And the final slide. I'd like to just finish with the fact that we are really eager to make sure that uh, there's quite a lot of data literacy available from ACLED to imp improve, of course, the understanding of our methodology, but also to visualize and analyze the data. And to do that, we would we really enjoyed engaging in, in this type of initiative because it's the first step to getting people to understand our perspective and, of course, how to access the ACLED data. And with that, I'm going to close out because I'm going to go over my time and I want to make sure that everybody has time to ask questions and to answer them. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Klina. That was super interesting. It was a very rich with information and I'm sure our colleagues and partners uh, learned a lot with, you, with your talk. Um, Colleagues, I just want to say that we have a terrible situation there with the chat uh, box. Unfortunately, it looks like none of you are able to write any comment or question. I was totally surprised because I was hoping to see many of you to um, to react there, but it seems there is a, a, an issue. So um, we're trying. We're trying to to fix it. Uh, alternatively, if you could just send an email with your question or comment at the email that we put there, that would be good. Alternative, also, we are thinking that you could also unmute yourself, and and voice your question or your comment. So we're trying to also enable that. But for the time being, we also received few questions in advance. So we can start with those just to uh, have the conversation ongoing, and maybe over to you, Meti. Uh, to address uh, those some of those uh, initial questions that uh, that we receive from 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 colleagues. Over to you, Meti. 
Thank you very much, Javier. And thank you very much, Professor Cleona, for the presentation and sharing your insights. Um, so going to the questions I have here with me, um, the first one is um, conflict events can be fluid. And um, so can you tell us uh, more about how often ACLA data is updated and verified and how you deal with historical ACLA data? Because historical uh, data sometimes change as more information becomes available. Um, so if you could just share shed some light on, on that. Over I would to love you. To. Thank you very much. I'm going to I'm going to give that to Leonard if he doesn't mind answering. As 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 head of methodology, he would have all that information. All right. Yes. Uh, thank you. Excellent uh, question. So. Um, as uh, as Clean already explained, uh, uh, conflicts are, are dynamic um, and they can uh, differ within country and uh, between countries. And so, what we do is we make sure that we have not only a very consistent approach where we structurally source the same sources uh, each week and uh, and update the events accordingly, but also that we evaluate the information uh, uh, environment on the ground and the developments on the ground to ensure that our data collection actually matches those two elements. You can imagine that, for example, over the years, uh, the editorial choices or the information availability uh, in some sources can change over time. Acklet notices that and responds to that by uh, picking up new sources to fill those gaps. Um, and as well as, uh, for example, new conflict actors emerging or new conflicts emerging, those aren't always picked up by, uh, by existing sources. And, and Acklet moves then to uh, make sure that new sources are included to properly cover those emerging conflicts. Now, what Acklet also does is general quality assurance which is uh, uh, when uh, we notice that there's more information available than that we have covered so far, we add this information to our data. We update existing events with new information going back. So our data that we already quoted is uh, improved uh, on a consistent basis, but we also go back and back code these uh, um, new sources that we add to our data um, to cover uh, the histori historical uh, periods that we have already uh, published. So, for example, uh, a new source or a new partner is added uh, that provide new information. We go back, for example, to 2018 and add all the new events that we can find through that source into our data, ensuring that our coverage is balanced and, um, and, uh, and reliable throughout that historical period. Um, I think that answers the question, or was there another element to it? I think that's excellent. Um, yeah, you've, you've covered it all. Um, I have another question. Uh, this one is from Ronald Santos from Pasto in Canada. Um, the question is, um, is ACLED data available as a data stream? Or does uh, one have to manually download the latest uh, data? And secondly, um, can you confirm the events are geocoded? Uh, thanks, Mete. I'm going to I'm going to give that to Kadiun if that's all right. Hi, everyone. Um, yes. So you can. We have two main sort of ways for you to download the data. There's an export tool feature on the website that makes it very easy for you to select exactly the countries or the regions and the time periods, the event types, actors, all of that information that you're interested in, and it'll create sort of a custom downloaded file for you. Um, but we also have an API um, that you can access using the same sort of email and access key that you have when you register. Um, and you can set up your API query to automatically sort of pull in events. We recommend really only pulling in events once a week. We upload um, new data on Mondays and Tuesdays, just depending on region. Um, and so Tuesday by close of business, 
um, or if you want to be safe Wednesday mornings, um, you can pull a new API call um, and download the, the newest data. And we have guides on the website as well for how to use the API, as well as um, sort of detailed instructions on how best to keep your data set updated. As Leonard just mentioned, we do go back and make corrections or remove events, et cetera. So it's always best to take all those things into account and that guide will list it all out for you. I didn't catch what the second part of the question was. I think the connection was going in and out. Sorry. Answer the second part of the question. Okay, please go want. ahead. Yes, the question was about um, to what geo position the uh, the events are, are coded. So ACLA codes events to the named location level, which is typically a village, a town, uh, in some larger cities. This can this can be a neighborhood, and ACLA provides. Uh, four decimal geo coordinates, latitude, longitude, to help identify those locations. Those coordinates are centered, like are on the centroid of a town. So they might land on a particular street or a particular square, but that does not mean that the event happened in that exact location. Acclet quotes uh, all events to the, uh, the general location uh, uh, or the populated place. And we have several reasons for this. One is uh, our do no harm policy. Uh, if we identify events to a too specific degree, this may, might become actionable to bad actors to uh, um, uh, visit uh, civil society actors uh, or to engage in other types of violence or repressive behavior. Uh, the other reason for this is for methodological consistency and, and sort of the ability to uh, reliably compare data across time and across regions, because information availability varies greatly and the detail of information about where an event happened exactly also varies greatly. And what we found is that the populated place is the most accurate level that we can get that is consistent across all these variables. If uh, we were to try and do this at a, at a greater level of detail, we would get very granular data in some countries with high information availability and very non-granular data in other countries, making it seem as if there are more events widely spread out in one country than there is in another. But in fact, this is only due to information availability. That's why we are coding to the populated place and not to a greater degree of precision. Excellent. Um, I have here another question from Bjorn Clausen uh, from Land Info. Um, and it's going back to the quality assurance uh, uh, process that you were mentioning earlier in the presentation. Uh, so the question is, to what extent um, does ACLED verify or uh, quality check information in the data set? And to what extent um, information in the data set uh, is based on several uh, sources? Maybe if you can just uh, touch on that point. Over. I actually think Leonard can also create. Pardon me. <laughs> I'm sorry for hogging the mic. Uh, yes, <laughs> happy to answer that question. Um, so we have an extensive process uh, 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 for reviewing and quality assurance. Every week, uh, the data goes through a multi-step process where, uh, first of all, the sources that we use are being verified. Uh, for example, we don't use random social media accounts, but we use sources that we have a certain level of trust in the information they provide. Our researchers then source the reports and evaluate the claims within them. Um, so if there are uh, claims that we don't trust, then we treat those uh, accordingly. Um, and then the researchers produce and uh, the ACLA data based on the information in the report. That goes through uh, um, uh, automated checks uh, to see if the, the transformations done to the data are being done correctly, but also to, to three steps of manual review. The researchers themselves review the data before they submit it to their manager. The manager condu uh, conducts a holistic review to ensure that the um, uh, events are properly represented, but also that they are consistently represented compared to other events over time uh, within that country and within other countries within the region and within between two coders for the same region. 
And then the last step of um, uh, human review is done uh, to ensure overall methodological consistency on a global level, comparison across regions, and as a final check for the quality of the data. Uh, in addition to this real-time process, we have a quality assurance uh, team that does um, uh, monthly sampling of all, uh, all regions uh, to ensure that data is correctly uh, coded so that we have processes of shadow coding, seeing if our team, quality assurance team, gets the same result as the team that coded the data. Um, we also look into specific quality uh, issues and we have weekly monitoring of, uh, of trends and uh, source usage to make sure that um, uh, uh, data that we are collecting um, is indeed reflective of trends on the ground. Thank you very much for that um, insight uh, into the QA process. Um, so the next question is from Quintin uh, with MSF. Um, the question is, could you please give more specifics on the three types of violence uh, mentioned in the maps, uh, the state-based conflict, non-state conflict, and one-sided violence, uh, particularly looking at uh, Brazil's um, uh, situation and trying to um, understand that map um, against these three categories, if you could uh, share more details on that. Um, Over to you, you colleagues. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm happy to. Actually, Quentin, that is not our classification. It was a it was an attempt to be able to compare two event data sets. So what I'm putting in the chat now is a link to the article where we review the different types of event conflict data sets available and how they differ. So um, we do not classify Brazil's conflict in that way, uh, but the article should give you more information about that. And please reach out if you have any other questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, so a question from Nicholas, uh, Nicholas Rager with Development Initiatives. Um, how does ACLED employ local languages to scan for relevant information? Is, it, is this through local researchers familiar with the language or are there any translation tools uh, employed? So is it a manual or some, some tools that are being used for the translation? Uh, Over to you. It's Please. manual, but uh, Leonard, if you want to add anything to it, you're very welcome to. Um, but no, it's uh, it's it's their own knowledge. But please go ahead, Leonard. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Yes. Um, so what are uh, what are we are you? I'm sorry. Can you rephrase the question? I uh, I only caught half of it, so I don't want to respond to the wrong question. The question was was a, was about how we are using and integrating different languages within the data, and so was it a translation tool, or are we um, are, are we hiring people and have local partners who in fact have these skills? Oh yes, absolutely. We hire people with local language skills. Um, we have done some tests with uh, with uh, translation, uh, automated translation. Um, and we have run into uh, very interesting cases. For example, uh, apparently in Uzbek, the difference uh, between uh, someone being shot or being uh, pelted with stones can be very difficult to discern by, uh, by Google Translate, but uh, our uh, local language researchers are very capable of picking this up and, uh, um, and pointing this out. Uh, so yeah, we do have a good reason why we, uh, we rely on our local language coders. Great, thank you for that. Um, so a question from Mili, um, in, from Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Netherlands. Um, how is ACLED data integrated into HDX and how um, the data is being used by end users? And as a policy maker, uh, Mili uh, um, is part of the MF. Uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Netherlands is particular, particularly interested in how humanitarian community uh, is using ACLED uh, data. So um, over to you, colleagues. Brilliant. I'm okay. going to go to Kadiyun to address that. And uh, Andrea, if you would like to come in um, after and note the way in which the analysis is used, that's also useful. Please, Kadiyun. 
Thanks, Myla. That's a great question. So the ACLA data are fed into the HDX system on a weekly basis. So on Wednesdays, once all of the weekly data uploads are complete, we then create a series of sort of custom files for HDX um, in particular. So we divide these out by country so people can easily just download the relevant events for their own country and it sort of aggregates for the user the number of events that we see there, et cetera. Um, the details sort of differ on the HDX website versus what you can pull straight from the ACLID website, but we think that the sort of files that are offered on HDX are the sort of easier to use, more kind of uh, synthesized version um, of the ACLID data. As far as how people are using it, I'll, I'll let Andrea maybe speak a bit more to it. I know that there's a wide variety of users, so not only within the humanitarian community, but also governments, also to some extent private um, entities as well. And we are trying to essentially give a mix of the analysis pieces that Kleena highlighted, some of the new data science tools that allow people that don't have perhaps their own data science teams in-house to be able to leverage some of these newer technologies that are coming out with the ACLA data, um, as well as sort of working on this idea of data literacy that Kleena mentioned earlier of how can we best help these organizations use ACLA data, understand it, um, and really integrate it into their workflows, whether that be sort of dashboards that they keep up to date, um, internal reporting, um, and so on. So we have lots of ideas for how to uh, expand on that in the future. But Andrea, if you had anything else to add. Great. Um, I'm also mindful of the time we have left. Um, so I just wanted to give you maybe one minute to just give us um, any um, any up to upcoming projects or initiative that um, ACLED is working on and, you know, the best way for individuals and organizations to get involved. Uh, if you could just share um, in one minute and then we will wrap up. Uh, Andrea, would you like to talk about some of the new initiatives, please? Uh, yes, very, very briefly. Of course, we are working to continue to produce our uh, kind of analytical uh, research outputs. Uh, we have, of course, uh, monthly regional reviews, which we publish every uh, first week of the month. We have uh, research reports that, uh, you know, try to uh, outline patterns of conflict around the world, and we have also research studies intended to be like in-depth divings on specific contexts. Uh, we have, of course, our observatories uh, for Mozambique and Ethiopia, particularly, and starting from this fall, we'll also add one more uh, on Yemen uh, in, in particular. We also have special series uh, when it comes to analysis in particular for the whole of Africa for covering uh, elections uh, and uh, of course our uh, work on the targeting of local officials for which we've just released a special issue as of uh, as of last week. And of course, other projects that both Cleon and Katayun mentioned, so the early warning, uh, the, um, the work on kind of population exposure to conflict and, and more. Over to you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Okay, so as we come to the end of this webinar, I uh, want to express our gratitude to our panelists, Professor Cleona, Leonard, Andrea, and Dr. Katayun, uh, for your valuable contributions to today's uh, discussion. And I also want to thank our audience for their engagement um, and their questions. Um, we hope this webinar has provided you with valuable knowledge and inspired further exploration. Before we conclude, I encourage everyone to visit HDX platform um, data.hamdata.org and ACLED's website, acleddata.com, to explore their vast collection of data and resources. So with that, we come to the end of today's webinar. We look forward to meeting you again on in our next uh, HDX Data Set Deep Dive. Have a wonderful day. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.